I made a video game. To do that, I also shifted Game Engine and decided it made sense to make something from start to finish for a game jam, because it's nice and simple, and a good motivator for actually completing something. Nice and simple. Nice and... ah. Let's talk game design. If you've followed my channel before, you'll probably know that I used to make games in Construct 3, an event-driven engine where you don't need to know any programming languages and it's instead your mastery of simply written events that produce gameplay systems. I can't remember why, but sometime in the last year or so I decided to try out GDevelop, an event-driven engine where you don't need to know any programming languages and it's instead your mastery of simply written events that produce gameplay systems. The thing with moving engines for me is that the fastest way that I learn is just by doing. I can watch years of tutorials, read enough books to fill the Library of Alexandria, or sit in a Discord talking to 27 billion other people and still learn just enough to write Hello World in a pink font. Nothing ever happens until I make it happen. A game jam is the perfect excuse for this because a tight deadline gives you a small time frame to actually try things out without getting bogged down in overscoped concepts that balloon outwards into four years to make a 2D platformer. Coincidentally, GDevelop were also hosting their own big game jam, the uh, GDevelop Big Game Jam, where the theme was Take Control, so it seemed to line up well with what I wanted to achieve. Now I don't know about you, but when I hear Take Control as a theme, I think about the act of controlling game characters as the gameplay loop itself, something where there is a direct and varied depth of challenge to the very action of control, so that whatever you're making is tied to the theme of the jam at the root and core of your game. For this reason, my main idea was to balance the challenge of controlling more than one character at once. In fact, the first game that sprang to mind was the criminally underrated X-Men Legends, where you control a party of four X-Men and an engine and format that went on to become Marvel Ultimate Alliance later on. Except in that series, any character you weren't controlling had AI behaviour to try and assist you, so that you could focus on either your favourite X-Man or directly facing the challenges in each level. But what I wanted to do was make it so that when you weren't controlling a character, nothing was, so that switching between them became a key pillar of the gameplay's challenge itself. Now, if I'm going to make you switch between characters, then you need a reason. Your very basic challenge, ignoring the context for a moment, is that an infinite number of mobs are entering an arena and attacking things, and you need to stop them. As the game goes on, you get more more enemies, they get faster, you know how that goes. It's nice and simple and the thing with the game jam is trying to keep things as simple as you can when you can, so don't worry too much about any of that yet, we'll come back to it later. All you need to know for now is there's lots of enemies to kill and they move in a reasonably predictable way for you to develop a strategy. Okay? Right. Good. Moving on. In games where you have only one character, that character does everything. Jumping, ducking, attacking, hiding, dancing, whatever. The whole point of a singular protagonist is that they're like a Swiss army knife of gameplay mechanics in a single package, so that you don't have to switch to another character at all, instead being capable of handling every challenge in the game's design. So it logically follows that if we're going to break it up into needing to control multiple characters, they can't all be perfect at everything. In fact, I decided to take it a step further and make them very specifically specialised. You know, like... Some of you watching this section are going to tell me I should have said Overwatch instead, but I'm an old man, so shut up. In Team Fortress 2, every class that you can play as has a series of specific scenarios where they are the best choice, and a usually equal number of scenarios where they're basically awful. The Engineer, for example, is really good at indirectly steering the enemy team in a certain direction by making them avoid a turret, while providing a point of support and immediate transportation to the rest of the team. He is equally at a pretty god-awful disadvantage when upgrading his equipment while a spy has wandered deftly behind the team's lines, especially when that team can move forward through the Engineer's own teleporters and get stabbed in the back like an idiot. Yes, I used to main Engineer, how can you tell? But the key thing isn't so much what roles TF2 has, it's more to do with which one it doesn't have. Because what it doesn't have is an all-around class with an assault rifle that can move at an average speed and fire at an average rate and generally play like a basic Call of Duty protagonist. Because when you have something like that, you take away from the effectiveness of specialised role in character design. So we're not going to have one of those. Instead, let's do a rundown of our four playable characters and what they do. First up, we have... He is a big, buff demon turtle. And because he's a turtle, he moves very, very slowly. But because he's big and buff, he also punches things really, really hard. His punch landing on an enemy immediately kills them, and there's a huge invisible hitbox wrapped around your attacks, so you can, if you position and time things right, kill a lot of enemies in a single blow. Then we have... In direct contrast to Raph, 
Pyro Dancer is a tiny, fast little imp thing that runs around at an insane speed but doesn't do a lot of damage. Instead, his attack creates a damage over time effect that sets fire to anything it touches so that they will eventually die, just not very quickly. Really good for eventually damaging a lot of enemies in a broad space rather than immediately killing things standing in one place. But if you think it's all about direct murder, then let me direct you to... Frosty the Frost Mage is a pacifist who doesn't kill people. His attacks in fact do no damage at all, but they do blow out in a pretty huge radius, and they slow every single enemy down to a tiny fraction of their maximum speed. Really useful if, for example, you want to punch them in the face as a giant turtle demon. Do you see where I'm going with this? Because you will when we get to... This is a character whose design was absolutely not based on anyone in particular. What? Well. The idea behind the architect is you create huge blocks of damaging pointy spiky thorns, which do damage when enemies walk through them, but more than that, whichever enemies spawn while those thorns are present will treat those blocks of thorns like obstacles in their pathfinding behaviour. What this means is that you can, in theory, redirect entire chunks of enemies and how they move to their destinations. I have to say in theory, because this being a game jam, I didn't have a lot of time to strategically test and refine this. It does work, it's just not immediately apparent and you can do very well with just the other three characters instead. To put a positive spin on it, the architect is probably the deepest and most complex character of the four and if you do spend the time to figure out exactly how it works, he might be the most useful role of them all. Now if you're paying attention, this breakdown of the character's abilities where three out of four of them don't really do much or in fact zero direct damage will make it apparent to you that the challenge of the primary loop comes down to how you taking control of each character with their specific strengths weaknesses and effects can optimize your ability to take out as many enemies as possible. Speaking of the enemies, we should probably talk about... If you've watched my videos before, you will know that I'm a huge lover of context. I spend far too much time in a game jam putting in frivolous things like voice acting and plot. But this time, I did exactly the same thing. The game is called Seal Team 666, and it's based around the idea that you, as an evil demonic overlord in a near eternal slumber regaining your power, are resting in your hellish chamber to recover your stamina or mana or blood pressure or whatever it is that evil demon kings are powered by, when a seemingly endless horde of courageous heroes decide to launch an assault to take you down while you're asleep, as if it's their best opportunity. Those heroes are looking to destroy the mystical seals that keep you locked away and protected while you're vulnerable, so you have employed the support of the titular SEAL Team 666. Unfortunately, the ethereal intelligence that usually automates their actions is broken, so you're going to have to take manual control of them all instead. You know what it's like. First thing in the morning, you're not really awake yet, an army of armoured knights starts trying to smash down your front door to stab you a thousand times. It's Monday morning, we've all been there. So phase one, an increasing number and variety of enemies come spawning in and you need to use the four different members of the SEAL team to stop them as much as you can. Of course, because I'm me, in the end, you can't. I love arcade games and a key component of arcade games is that they were designed to eventually become unbeatable, that the skill ceiling is far beyond what 99% of people can handle so that you always have encouragement for improvement and a reason to come back again. We're doing the same thing here. In fact, there's a leaderboard at the end that ties into recurring encouragement, where you can enter your score of total heroes felled. Enemy speed gets faster, quantity goes up, and even a subtle little shift where after a certain amount of time, the enemies don't go to a predetermined target, they pick a random one instead. What this means is that past a certain point, you can't keep track of and strategize for where the mobs are going, and you have to instead react well to what they choose to do. All of this combined means eventually you're going to lose, which is fine. It's meant to happen because then you go on to... One of my other design philosophies is something historic that I absolutely cannot take credit for. It's the rule of cool. This originated in the tabletop RPG days of Dungeons and & Dragons, and the basic idea is that if something is cool or awesome, even if it's not realistic and doesn't necessarily make sense, you should let it happen because it's going to make things more fun. I believe in the rule of cool as a strict design philosophy and you can see it in action in this particular game because phase 2 is where you play as the overlord demon king boss guy himself, the size of a building, wandering around slamming down a sword bigger than a boss. You're going to die, probably very quickly, but who cares? It's a cathartic and satisfying ending that you're rewarded with for playing with the complexity of the four characters before that, and it ties into the context that I have a compulsion to include in everything, wrapping the entire game up very neatly from beginning to end. And like I said, it's cool. 
and that's enough. The more important thing is that I've now made a game in a whole new engine from what I used to use. It got finished in a reasonable time frame and it works sort of how I'd hoped that it would. If I was going to take it further, obviously there's so much more I'd need to do. Especially an idea that maybe you can leave your characters when you're not controlling them doing something. Standing still and attacking in place, most likely as if you're controlling some kind of real-time tower defense game. Not an awful idea, but this is also a game jam game, so it was never intended to become a fully released game of the year. Oh, and just for reference, it was also made with mostly free public assets from packs that I've acquired over the years, and animations from Mixamo, because I'm lazy. Obviously. If you want to play the game yourself, keep all of this in mind and check out the link in the description. And then if you've enjoyed listening to the design process behind it, then like this video if you liked this video that you just liked, and subscribe for more videos like the video you liked since you liked it, and I will see you the next time I'm thinking, hey, let's talk game design.